In this next example, reflect, shift, and sum approach number two, we're going to look at kind of a similar example, but these signals aren't going to go on for forever. So we could just use the approach we used before, where we just evaluate the discrete time convolution for each point in time that we need a value. But the signals are long enough to where you probably don't want to do that. It's probably better to use this reflect, shift, and sum approach to actually get equations out. So the signals we're going to deal with are x of k, and x of k is 1 for time k between 0 and 4. So if we plot x of k, it looks like this. It's 0 everywhere except for the time samples k equals 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4, where it's equal to 1. So that's what x of k looks like. And then h of k is alpha to the k for values of k between 0 and 6 for alpha greater than 1. So if we plot h of k, here's the time axis k, We'll plot it in blue. It looks like this. Alpha is greater than 1, so as time increases, a number larger than 1 raised to the power k is this increasing exponential. So that's what x or h of k looks like, and it is the equation alpha to the k on that time interval between 0 and 6. And what we're asked to do is we're asked to compute x of k convolved with h of k, which by definition is the sum from minus infinity to infinity over m of x of m, h of k minus m. Now we could do this like we did before, compute the start and stop points and actually just evaluate every value of k that we want and just write out all these terms. The problem is the sum will have more terms and it's probably worth doing it that way. So we're going to use the reflect, shift, and sum approach to actually get out analytic equation for different periods of time. So the key to doing convolution is all about sketching these signals in the discrete time convolution. One of the signals that we need to sketch is x of m. Sketching x of m is easy because it looks just like x of k, except we've replaced the time variable k with m. And then we also need to sketch h of k minus m. So this is a time reversed and shifted signal. So instead of increasing exponentially to the right, it's increasing exponentially to the left. It's been time reversed. And then it's been shifted. So where it used to turn on at time 0, it now turns off at time k. And you'll notice, again, I haven't labeled the time origin anywhere. I've simply labeled the points on the m axis to indicate where it starts and stops. So it starts at k minus 6 and it stops at time k. And k is a variable right now. In the subsequent slides, we will choose different values or regions for k and we'll be able to sketch h of k minus m with the time origin labeled. So let's go ahead and do that. What about the situation where k is less than 0? So here's a little cartoon of what this situation looks like in terms of the signal h of k minus m and x of m. So you can see in this situation, they don't overlap at all. So once I take their product, since they don't overlap, that product is 0 for all time. So when I sum up 0 for all time, I end up getting 0. So the convolution sum in this case is 0. So for all values k less than 0, my convolution is equal to 0. Let's look at the next case. This case is for the values of k equal to 0 up to 4. So I sketched a little cartoon here, and I've shown the overlap. h of k minus m has slid into x of m, and it overlaps with it for times 0 up to k. So when I write my discrete time convolution, my sum doesn't go from minus infinity to infinity. Well, it actually does. But all of the terms less than 0 are 0. All of the terms greater than k are 0. I only need to sum from 0 to k. So I have to sum from m equals 0 to k of x of m times h of k minus m. So this is equal to the sum from 0 to k of 1, because that's what x of m is equal to on this time interval, times alpha to the k minus m, because that's what h of k minus m is equal to. I can rewrite that as just the sum of alpha to the k minus m. And then to actually complete this sum, we need to do a little bit of a change of variable here. If I let r equal k minus m, so we want to work this into the form that we're used to seeing in our table. If I let r equals k minus m, then when m is 0, r is k, and when m is k, r is 0. So I have the sum now over r, from k to 0 of alpha to the r. But usually we write sums with increasing counters, so I can flip the order of summation. That's totally legit. And now I have this sum, the sum from r equals 0 to k of alpha to the r. Well, we've seen this before. We just looked this up in a table. That's equal to 1 minus alpha to the k plus 1. Remember, we always raise it to the top limit plus 1, so our top limit and our sum is k. 
so I've raised it to the k plus 1, and then divide by 1 minus alpha. So for all times k, 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4, this is what our convolution is equal to. The next interval we need to look at is for times k, 5 less than or equal to 6. Again, I've drawn the kind of cartoon here showing h of k minus m and x of m. So h of k minus m is now slid to the point where it is totally encompassing x of m, because x of m only exists between 0 and 4. So the limits that we're going to need to sum over now reduce to just between 0 and 4. So when I write my convolution sum, it's the sum from m equals 0 to 4 of 1 times alpha to the k minus m, which I can write as the sum from 0 to 4 of alpha to the k times alpha to the minus m. Alpha to the k is just a number. I can factor that out. And instead of writing it as alpha to the minus m, I can write that as alpha to the minus 1 to the m. And now this is in a form that I know how to write down the answer. Alpha to the k times the quantity 1 minus whatever thing I'm raising to my counter variable divided by 1 minus whatever thing I'm raising to my counter variable. So alpha to the minus 1 here is what my counter variable m is raising each time. And then I raise in the numerator, it's to 5, because we always add 1 to the top limit. So I can rearrange this just a little bit. If I multiply through by alpha to the k, I get alpha to the k minus alpha to the k minus 5 over 1 minus alpha inverse. Then I can multiply numerator and denominator by negative alpha inverse to just flip the order of the subtraction, and also get rid of the, the uh, alpha to the negative 1 on the denominator to write it like this. Next time interval is for values of k greater than or equal to 7, less than or equal to 10. So again, our cartoon, x of k minus m has slid by quite a bit, but it still overlaps a little. And it overlaps from its back edge, which on our original plot was k minus 6, and it overlaps up until time 4. So our discrete time convolution is going to sum from k minus 6 up to 4. And then the product is 1, because that's what x of m is equal to, times alpha to the k minus m. So we rewrite it like this. And I'll do a change of variable again. Here I'm going to let r equal m minus k plus 6. So if that's what I let r equal, what happens when m is equal to the bottom limit, k minus 6? Well, when that happens, r is equal to 0. And when m is equal to the top limit of 4, I have r is equal to 10 minus k. Also, if I rearrange this and solve for the quantity k minus m, which is in my summation, I get that it is 6 minus r. So if I make those substitutions in, my new sum is from 0 to 10 minus k, and it's alpha to the, it used to be k minus m, but k minus m is equal to 6 minus r. I can factor out an alpha to the 6, and I can write alpha to the negative r as alpha to the negative 1 to the r, and now this is exactly in my table. This is alpha to the 6, 1 minus alpha to the k minus 11, 1 minus alpha inverse. So remember, we raise alpha to the top limit plus 1. So the top limit was 10 minus k. So if I add 1 to that, I get 11 minus k. And then the alpha to the negative 1, when it multiplies, it flips the sign. So instead of 11 minus k, it's k minus 11. So that's what we get. And I can go ahead and multiply numerator and denominator by alpha and I get alpha minus alpha to the k minus 10, and alpha minus 1 on the denominator. I can go ahead and multiply the alpha to the 6 through, and this is what I get. And on any of these steps here, you know, once you get rid of the summation and you have an answer, that answer is totally fine. Just sometimes simplifying it down to where some of these terms look the same. For instance, having alpha minus 1 on the denominator is just kind of a nice thing to do sometimes. So the last case we need to look at is when k minus 6 is greater than 4 or when k is greater than 10. So this is kind of the cartoon for this situation. Again, we have no overlap because that back edge, which was k minus 6, has slid past the front edge of x of m. So we have no overlap, and y of k is 0. So we've, we've computed all these different regions. Some of them were kind of small. Some of these equations were only good for a couple values of k. Others were larger. They were good for, you know, 3, 4, 5 values of k. If the signals were a little bit shorter, it might have been smart just to go ahead and just plug in one by one and just compute these values. But for slightly longer signals, this is the better way to do it. And we can piece all these together now. We've computed y of k for time k greater than or equal to 0, less than or equal to 4. We had this expression for values of k equal 5 and 6. We had this for values of k greater than or equal to 7, less than or equal to 10, and it was 0 everywhere else.